I want you to turn in your Bibles this evening to Daniel chapter 3. We're going to see Nebuchadnezzar's response to a divinely given dream and a divinely given interpretation of the dream. What will Nebuchadnezzar do after hearing from the God of the universe? What will be his action plan? How will he apply it to his own life? Now, those are important questions, and, and we need to think sometimes about having the right takeaway from certain lessons. Have you ever learned the wrong lesson from something? I was uh, examining the rear tire of my son's bike. It was one of those little bikes when I had a little son. I don't have a little son anymore. But it was one of those little tiny bikes, and we had gotten it secondhand at a garage sale. And in examining the bike, I realized the back tire was old, and my takeaway was it needs more air. That was not the right lesson. And we kept adding air and adding air and adding air until the massive explosion could have put somebody's eye out. It was terrifying. I think we all went away crying. What just happened? And pieces of tire everywhere. I learned the wrong lesson. The lesson was I need a new back tire. I don't know if you've ever come away from a sermon and have the wrong takeaway, a misapplication of a passage, a misapplication of a message. Maybe you've come away from a text and taken away the wrong applications. And I'll just be iconoclastic here. We'll do battle with the favorite interpretation of Jeremiah 29, 11. If you've got it cross-stitched on your living room wall, I'm so sorry. That is not about God's plans for you for your next job, plans to prosper you. And Jeremiah 29, 11 was specific to God's plans for his nation Israel in Babylonian captivity. And we get in trouble when we take away the wrong application from a very right message. And Nebuchadnezzar has gotten a remarkable message from the Lord, and yet he will misapply that message. The appropriate response to the Daniel chapter 2 dream and its interpretation from Yahweh, the one true God, is this, worship Yahweh. That's the message. What was, that was the, that was the application of the message, personally for Nebuchadnezzar. What did Nebuchadnezzar actually do with that message from Daniel 2? Let's read Daniel 3. Here's Nebuchadnezzar's response, his applicational action plan, if you will. Nebuchadnezzar, king, made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits and its width six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, To you, command is given, O peoples, nations, and tongues, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire." Therefore, at that time, when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and tongues fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Nebuchadnezzar's application of Daniel chapter 2 is a misapplication. There was a dream from God and an interpretation from God. Nebuchadnezzar is a remarkable beneficiary of direct divine revelation. And Nebuchadnezzar's take was incorrect. You see, the dream was about a succession of rebellious human kingdoms that will eventually be replaced by God's everlasting kingdom. And you remember at the end of chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar responded with something of a confession. 
Daniel 2.47, the king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries since you have been able to reveal this mystery. And Nebuchadnezzar promoted Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar heard the message, but his next move was a misapplication of God's message in a three-step action plan. A three-step action plan. That's what we're looking at tonight is Nebuchadnezzar's application of Daniel 2. And the first part of his action plan was he set up a giant golden statue. Look down at verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, seven times in this short passage we hear the phrase Nebuchadnezzar made or Nebuchadnezzar set up. And Nebuchadnezzar is doing something here, and it's very interesting that what Nebuchadnezzar is making and what Nebuchadnezzar is setting up will become an object of worship. That is a remarkable and tragic irony. But we are made to feel the weight of Nebuchadnezzar making this and then setting it up, the image which he set up, which he set up, which he set up, which he set up. And he sets up this image, this statue, outside of the city proper, but within the province of Babylon. Babylon, as you know, was a city. The, the nation of Babylon was the surrounding province, and Babylon grew and took over other nations. And so the outlying provinces were the other territories that Nebuchadnezzar had taken over to build his empire. Those other territories required bureaucratic government structures, people in those regions to govern and control. Just like in Israel, in Judah, in Jerusalem, vassal kings were set up. They were slave kings set up to take tax money and rule the people in Nebuchadnezzar's place. And that was true not only for the teeny tiny little nation of Israel that Nebuchadnezzar controlled, but also all of the big countries that he controlled. So this massive empire of, of Babylon was centralized in the province of Babylon and from there centralized in the city of Babylon. Well, just outside city proper in the plain of Dura, that, that location is hard to identify, but most likely relates to one of three locations just outside, maybe within 15 miles or so of the city walls of Babylon itself. And Nebuchadnezzar made and then caused to be set up this image. And the seven times repetition of this cause to be set up has the effect of building tension towards something climactic that is coming in the story. And it's striking that Nebuchadnezzar made an image. And Exodus 20 prohibits, of course, the making of images. Uh, this is in the Ten words, the Ten Commandments. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven or on earth beneath or the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them for I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God. This, of course, is the prohibition from Israel's God for his own people Israel. They were not to make images and likenesses and they violated this left and right. They made images that they supposed were of Yahweh himself, Exodus 32 and the golden calf, and then they made images of all the other gods of the nations. And they had poles and statues and altars to all the gods of the nations that they were to avoid. They became idolatrous and all of these things. But this is a fundamental prohibition that goes beyond just not worshiping other gods. It is that the God of the universe, the invisible God who lives in unapproachable light, is not to be reproduced in some sort of tangible, visible representation. And it is such the heart of man to make God seeable, capturable, formable, holdable, that mankind readily falls into the trap of making deity smaller than man, which is exactly what happens when you make something. You're bigger than the thing you make. And even though this statue was giant, it was, metaphysically speaking, smaller than Nebuchadnezzar because Nebuchadnezzar made it and caused it to be set up. Humans gravitate to these things regularly. The statue is said to be made of gold, probably not pure gold through and through, 
but gold ensconced on the outside of some structure. We read, for instance, that the tabernacle furniture in the Old Testament was gold. You had the golden table of the presence. You had the Ark of the Covenant, which was gold. They were made of acacia wood and then covered in gold. It's quite likely that this statue was made that way. There have been Babylonian statues that uh, ancient historians wrote about that were made of wood and covered in gold. And so it's very likely that is how Nebuchadnezzar had this one made. And it was said to be 60 by 6 cubits. That is 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide or in diameter. That is 90 by 9 if a cubit is 18 inches. So 90 feet high and, and 9 feet wide. It, it's a little bit fatter than a date palm, but much skinnier than a person in proportion. That's a 10 to 1 ratio. A normal human ratio is something like 5 to 1 or 6 to 1. We're not going to try to identify who's who, but 10 to 1 is a massively skinny and strangely grotesque statue. It's an exaggeration of form, and it is to stand above the Babylonian plain in dazzling form. This could have likely been seen from some 15 miles away and brilliant in the desert sunlight. Is this Nebuchadnezzar? Is this Nebuchadnezzar's favorite god, Marduk, or the god of his namesake, Nebo or Nabu, or, or some other god? Or does this stand for the Babylonian empire and all of its greatness of which Nebuchadnezzar is the representative? And you have to understand that the Babylonian pantheon was not a jealous pantheon. It's not as if Marduk was upset that people, wor people worshipped Nebo, or Nebo was upset that people worshipped Nebuchadnezzar, or that Nebuchadnezzar was upset that people worshipped a statue. See, polytheism works that way. It doesn't really matter what the statue was there to represent. The text doesn't tell us, but it's all one and the same. If anything is to be worshipped and it's not the one true God, it is all the same religion. Most likely, this is something of all three. The greatness of Nebuchadnezzar representing his empire backed by the Babylonian pantheon. But notice this statue is unlike the statue that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about. This doesn't just have a head of gold, but the entire statue is gold. And just think about what this means for Nebuchadnezzar's application of a divine message. Nebuchadnezzar hears directly from the Lord of the universe that there is a series of successive kingdoms in a timeline of empires moving from top to bottom, and that Nebuchadnezzar is the head and he is gold. No doubt Nebuchadnezzar was flattered by this and threatened. What happens to the statue? It's obliterated. And it's not just that the ending empires are, are obliterated, but the entire history of sinful, rebellious human governance is turned to powder and blown away by the summer breeze, including the head of gold. So Nebuchadnezzar heard the message. What's his takeaway? <laughs> we're not going silver. <laughs> we're not going bronze. We're not going iron. And we're certainly not going iron mixed with clay at the bottom. That's a bad move. We're going gold top to bottom. Nebuchadnezzar's takeaway is to make a monolithic structure after his own image, to build a legacy, a Babylonian Nebuchadnezzarite legacy that cannot be tottered, that cannot be blown to bits, that cannot be tossed by the summer breeze. Nebuchadnezzar saw the dream perhaps as an omen rather than a declaration of the sovereign God of history. And, and thinking about an omen, an omen was a, a warning portending some danger that if you played your cards right or if you appeased the gods just right or you changed the course of history, you could alter that omen. It would not come true. If I know the future, then, then I can bring about changes to the future. This is Nebuchadnezzar's application. He's dreaming, in fact, of undoing the declaration of the sovereign God of history. He's trying to undo biblical prophecy. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't know who he's dealing with yet. 
And notice back in his confession in verse 47 of chapter 2, surely, Daniel, your God, the, 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 the God of Israel, that puny little nation that we conquered where we really were sure that our gods were stronger than your gods because, look, you're here and you're my slave, but your God is something. Um, he's a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. He does not say your God is the God. So there's a confession here in Nebuchadnezzar. There's a concession from Nebuchadnezzar's lips. But it is not full, unadulterated faith in the one true God. What is Nebuchadnezzar dreaming about here? He's dreaming about his own self-exaltation. He's built a monument to human greatness, a devotion to pagan gods, and a rallying point for satanic rebellion against the one true God. All in his own name. Nebuchadnezzar's section, second action point of applying Daniel 2 is he gathered his empire in front of the statue. He makes the statue, sets it up in the plain of Dura, and then he gets the entire empire to surround it. Look at verse 2. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king set up. And, and there are several layers here of governmental officials. Satraps and prefects are first. Those are big-time regional characters. Those are people that have control over large areas. Separated by and, you get another group, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates. These are lower bureaucratic levels of administration in Nebuchadnezzar's government. And then, in order not to leave anybody off, the last category, and all rulers, literally all officials of the provinces... So every regional ruler, every layer of bureaucratic government in all the conquered lands, all the conquered territories, as well as Babylon Central, they have all come here to the dedication of the image. Nebuchadnezzar has said, I built this thing, I set it up, and I want you all here pronto. And the invitation to a dedication, it kind of sounds like a graduation party or a, a baby dedication, maybe a, maybe a baby shower or a housewarming party. Come see my kingdom, come see this statue. But there's something far more sinister here, both politically and religiously. Nebuchadnezzar is attempting to unify his empire. He has taken over broad swaths of territory with people of differing worldviews, differing languages, different religions. And all these conquered regions need to be sewn and stitched together. He feels acutely what happens at the bottom of the statue from Daniel chapter 2. Remember, the clay with iron did not adhere to each other. He wants adhesion. How is he going to get adhesion he understands, like many tyrants throughout history have understood, that the unification of religious sentiment is an adhesion to draw people together. It is a powerful influence. If you can make everybody conform to the same religious sentiment, the same religious experiences, the same religious authority, you can have control whether it's the elimination of religion altogether in some sort of atheist state or the conformity to one particular brand. And, and notice this brand that he is getting his empire to buy into is a tolerant brand. We'll talk more about that. It is a universal religion he's after, but it's a universal religion that includes people who happen to worship other gods. It will only disallow one type. This design to unify the empire is a, will become a test of loyalty of all of his subjugated peoples. This was going to be an issue of national pride, of patriotic loyalty combined with religious fervor. To violate the command that is coming would be akin to treason, punishable by death. And look at verse 3. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. 
Now, every word I just read, we've already read in the previous verses. And you were hoping I wouldn't read it, that I would just reference it and move on. But I read it because it's there. And Daniel wrote it, and God wanted Daniel to write it, and it captures the scene. Listen, it has the effect of you looking around this mass of humanity, standing before this giant golden image, and noticing there's a satrap. Ooh, and that's a prefect. And there's a governor, and there are judges, and magistrates, and treasurers, and all the officials, and you're looking around, and you're seeing them again and again and again. And there is a weight of pressure of the mass of important people all together for one purpose. We are to feel that weight. So we get this repetition. And notice the end of verse three, and they stood before the image. Here they all are. All the officials from every level, from every region were to come. Everybody on the federal payroll um, we do, I think, understand some exceptions. Uh, no doubt there would have had to be some people left behind in some places to manage things for a time. Uh, one example would be Daniel himself in chapter 2, verse 49. Uh, we find that Daniel was at the king's court. That's an important last sentence in Daniel chapter 2. We might wonder, is Daniel bowing down when the three friends aren't? Where's Daniel? Chapter 2, the end of chapter 2, reminds us or tells us, places Daniel at the scene of the king's court, not out at the plains of Dura. And so that's probably an example, a, a tip for us to understand that uh, there would be some left behind. But this almost monotonous list of all the administrative levels of bureaucratic office is designed to help us feel the weight of the pressure to conform Join the millions who have already signed up for Publishers Clearinghouse Sweepstakes. Oh man, I'm not one of the millions and millions. I'm left out. I better get on that bandwagon. There is power in numbers. There are strength in movements. And when all the important people are all going all the same way, how can anyone think to go the other way? This is intentional by Nebuchadnezzar. And when it says they were assembled in verse 3, literally they were gathering for themselves and the verse is intensive. It's like they got up all their stuff and they came. They, for their own self-interest, they came and gathered to this thing. And, and what would that self-interest be? They were either motivated by the carrot or the spurs. right? The carrot out in front of the horse, I'm running to get something, or spurred from behind, being forced, compelled by terror to move forward. Either I want to move up the ladder, kiss the ring, do whatever it takes, or I don't want to lose my job or my life. This is a powerful, unifying procedure from Nebuchadnezzar, and he's invoking religion to get what he wants done. Whenever the state has an interest in religion, uh, you better be sure that the state has an interest in control. Uh, there's a very dangerous tendency among uh, tyrants of many ages to do this very thing. I want to read to you from the 1930s in Germany uh, from William Shire's book, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, because he knew the power of religion and he knew the German nationalism tied to German religion. I feel like I'm echoing a lot. Am I echoing for you? I'm echoing for me. Is it just me? In the 1930s, we find out that hundreds of confessional church pastors were arrested. In 1936 alone, hundreds of them were taken away, murdered, or taken to con concentration camps. The funds were confiscated, their properties were taken away. And then the Nazi party made this statement. The party stands on the basis of positive Christianity. And positive Christianity is national socialism or Nazism. National socialism is the doing of God's will. God's will reveals itself in German blood. 
Dr. Zellner and Count Galen, the Catholic Bishop of Munster, have tried to make clear that Christianity consists in faith in Christ as the Son of God. That makes me laugh. No, Christianity is not dependent on the Apostles' Creed. True Christianity is represented by the party, and the German people are now called by the party, and especially by the Fuhrer, to a real Christianity. The Fuhrer is the herald of a new revelation. Nazi Germany, had, Nazi Germany had a vested interest in calling itself Christianity, albeit of a new flavor. In 1937, 807 pastors and leading laymen of the confessional church were arrested, hundreds more in the next couple of years. But for the majority of Protestant pastors, they, like almost everyone else in Germany, submitted in the face of Nazi terror. By the end of 1937, the highly respected Bishop Maharens of Hanover was induced by Dr. Curl of the Nazi party to make this public declaration. The national socialist conception of life is the national and political teaching which determines and characterizes German manhood. As such, it is obligatory upon German Christians also. In 1938, that bishop took a final step of ordering all pastors in his diocese to swear a personal oath of allegiance to the Fuhrer. And in a short time, the vast majority of Protestant clergymen took the oath, thus binding themselves legally and morally to obey the commands of the dictator. Where did this end up? It ended up just a year later in the National Reich Church. And the National Reich Church made these claims. Exclusive right and exclusive power to control all churches in the borders of the Reich. The National Church has no scribes, pastors, chaplains, or priests, but National Reich orators are only to speak in them. The National Church demands immediate cessation of the publishing and dissemination of the Bible in Germany. The National Church declares that to it, and therefore to the German nation, it has been decided that the Fuhrer's Mein Kampf is the greatest of all documents. It not only contains the greatest, but it embodies the purest and truest ethics for the present and future life of our nation. The National Church will clear away from its altars all crucifixes, Bibles, and pictures of saints. On the altars, there must be nothing but Mein Kampf to the German nation and to God, the most sacred book, and to the left of the altar, a sword. On the day of its foundation, the Christian cross must be removed from all churches, cathedrals, and chapels, and it must be superseded by the only uncomparable symbol the swastika. It was important to wed religious people to a religious ideal to get them to go along with the tyrant and to salve their conscience in a really perverted way. I can still call myself a Christian because our leaders just said to be Christian is to be German and to be German is to be Nazi. Christian equals Nazi. I got it. I can be a Christian. Terrifying. Many tyrants have taken on that same tactic. They recognize that there is power in a crowd, that there is a unifying principle of religious fervor. You can feel that at Neyland Stadium in the fall when everybody wears orange and cheers for the Tennessee Volunteers and 102,000 people are saying the same thing at the same time. It's compelling. You want to be a volunteer, even in a losing season. We feel this at a concert or a high school pep rally or an anarchist mob. When everybody's doing the same thing at the same time, everybody chanting the same words together. And in this scene, to see all the dignitaries, the celebrities, the powerful, the important people gathered in one place, standing, waiting for the sound of the music. Notice the end of verse 3, and they stood before the image, literally, and a rising before the image. We're just left hanging. <laughs> what happens next? Imagine the scene. You've been invited to a dedication, and then when you get there, there's a command, and then there's a cue. There will be music that signals the appropriate behavior. When you hear the music, do the thing. Nebuchadnezzar's third piece of his action plan is compulsory worship. He compelled everyone to worship the statue. There's a call to worship. There is enforced obedience 
and then universal compliance. Look at the call to worship beginning in verse 4. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, the herald literally spoke with all strength to you. The command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. This is the herald saying again and again, Hear ye, hear ye, here is the command. This is the royal edict. This command is given. And it is given to peoples and nations. And the New American Standard Bible has men of every language. It simply in the Aramaic reads peoples, nations, and tongues. And this phrase, peoples, nations, and tongues, happens again and again in the book of Daniel. And if you're fast-forwarding your Bible in your mind, you, you, you resonate with that phrase, peoples and nations and tongues, or peoples, tongues, and, and tribes and nations. You know, this is a familiar phrase. The, the import here in this text is that there is pressure. Really, everyone is doing it. Everyone from everywhere. And sure, people have their own lands and they have their own gods, but here in Babylon, everyone is bowing to this image. But when we think forward to the book of Revelation, chapter 5 and 7 and 10, 11, 13, 14, and 17, and we hear the same phrase again, what are we discovering there? That the Lord Jesus Christ, whose kingdom we looked at last week, is assembling for himself a people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. And in the book of Revelation, the great imitator is attempting to assemble for himself peoples and tribes and nations. And that great imitator, Satan, has been at it from time immemorial. And just like in the book of Revelation, the Antichrist will show up as a lamb but with horns and evil intent. He's assembling nations and tribes and peoples to his own sordid interests. Here, Nebuchadnezzar is trying to gather a universal worship around an idol. And we know that the Lord Jesus Christ will one day do that for himself with real worship, from real worshipers. Notice the command in verse 5. At the moment you hear the sound, there's an immediacy to this. We'll see this phrase repeated again. All at once. The moment you hear the sound. And if you were there and, and everybody was standing silent in anticipation, they had obeyed the summons and they were all there, all the important people. And the command was given when the music starts, bow and worship, fall down worshiping. And you're just waiting. And that first note, immediately, all at once, you are to fall down. Again, this is a unifying procedure. There's something striking when you watch a finely tuned marching band all doing the same thing at the same time, when every toe is up at the same angle across a football field. It's sharp, it's crisp, it's compelling, it makes you want to get down there and do it. There's something sharp and, and crisp and compelling about everybody at the same time on this signal, fall down. And, and, and who would refuse this? Who would want to stick out? Who would want to be a, a sore thumb sticking out in the crowd, disunifying this beautiful procedure? And what's not being done here is an internal check. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is not sending around guards to check the internal status of your heart. Did you mean it when you fell down? Uh, they're not checking motives. They're, they're not checking thought processes. Uh, at this point, they're not thought police saying, wait a second, are you crossing your fingers and really worshiping some other god from your homeland? The command is simple. Fall down and worship I want you to turn to Isaiah 44, because this is just dumb. What everybody is about to do, all together, at the same time, with some little jingle, is just dumb. And Isaiah satirizes this famously in Isaiah 44, in speaking about how silly it is that a created being would create an inanimate non-being and fall down before it in worship. 
Look at verse 9. Those who fashion a graven image are all of them futile, and their precious things are of no profit. Even their own, own witnesses fail to see or know, so that they will be put to shame. Who has fashioned a god or cast an idol to no profit? Behold, all his companions will be put to shame, for the craftsmen themselves are mere men. Let them all assemble themselves. Let them stand up. Let them tremble. Let them together be put to shame. The man shapes iron into a cutting tool, does his work over the coals, fashioning it with hammers and working it with his strong arm. He also gets hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and becomes weary. Another shapes wood. He extends a measuring line. He outlines it with red chalk. He works it with planes and outlines it with a compass. He makes it like the form of a man, like the beauty of a man, so that it may sit in a house. That's it? All that work? You, you did all this stuff and it, it sits? Surely he cuts cedars for himself and takes a cypress or an oak and raises it for himself along the trees of the forest. He plants a fir and, makes rain, and the rain makes it grow. Then it becomes something for a man to burn. So he takes one of them and warms himself. He also makes fire to bake bread. He also makes a god and worships it. He makes it a graven image and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over this half he eats meat as he roasts and roasts and is satisfied. He warms himself and says, Aha, I'm warm, I have seen the fire. But the rest of it he makes into a god, his graven image. He falls down before it and he worships. He prays to it and says, Deliver me, you're my god. They do not know, nor do they understand, for he has smeared their eyes so that they cannot see their hearts. They cannot see, and he has smeared over their hearts so they cannot comprehend. And no one recalls, nor is there any knowledge or understanding to say, I burned half of it in the fire and I've baked bread over its coals. I roast meat and eat it. Then I make the rest of it into an abomination and I fall down before a block of wood. He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver himself, nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? And with Nebuchadnezzar, there's a lot more man hours and a lot more work than growing a forest, felling a tree, cutting it to pieces, making a meal, and carving an idol. The amount of gold involved in a plated 90 foot by 9 foot statue is staggering in terms of man hours, work hours, profit, money. And all of that for what? A lie, a falsehood. That all that statue could do is stand there in the desert sun and glisten. <laughs> It is a nothing. And everybody here is going to get in front of a great big nothing and fall down and worship. What a tragedy. Notice the accompaniment. Verse 5, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. I did a lot of reading on all of these instruments. Um, I'm just going to summarize it this way. It's a bunch of instruments. <laughs> we can move on. <laughs> but notice what Nebuchadnezzar has done here in employing the band the orchestra, all kinds of music. It, this is interesting. He has employed people who have crafted ways of making melodic sound. One of the words here is where we get our, our word for symphony. So a conglomeration of sounds that go together. A really remarkable thing here. We recognize the power of music. If, if you've been to a large concert and you've seen an entire crowd moved at the same time by sound. It's compelling. It's engaging. And we're all sewn together in our humanity by this thing called music. It's remarkable. It can be employed for good or evil. Nebuchadnezzar clearly here is employing it for political gain and sinister, idolatrous evil. It adds to the magnetism of the conformity and the power of the crowd. Listen, when, when somebody starts playing the organ behind my sermon, I'm going to get nervous. 
There's, just, there's something going on here. We need to gin up the emotions to go along with the things being said and get us all into this climactic moment where we're ready. Yes. It is a manipulation. And notice the enforced obedience in verse 6. There's a call to worship, and then just in case that doesn't work, whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. What is the risk of not coming to the summons, of not falling down and worshiping? Well, you're going to lose your good government job, you're going to be accused of treason, and you're going to be immediately executed. All the power, all the influence, all the wealth you've enjoyed by being on the government dole, gone. And all you got to do to keep your life, keep your job, keep your power, keep your influence, just do what everybody else is doing. It's just a simple motion. Music, you, you can even cross your fingers and keep one eye open and talk about your own idol on your shelf back home if you want. But you got to conform. The word immediately here is the same word as we've seen in verse 5, in the moment, and then again in verse 7, we'll see it again, uh, at that time. All those are the same phrase, and it just piles on the immediacy of what has to happen. When you hear the sound of the music, do this, and when the music played, they did this. They all fell down and worshiped. And if you don't, then immediately, at that moment, where will you be? In the midst of the furnace of the fire burning, literally. Archaeologists have discovered the Babylonian brick kilns and the ovens used for smelting ore. They were kind of a conical feature that maximized the heat from coal that was fired. It would have been black smoke billowing out the top and thousands of degrees inside. You would have heard the searing of the blazing ovens, perhaps stage left, while the king sits stage right with the throngs bowing down before the golden statue. These kilns were designed to get the temperatures way up. This means that the, the word immediately here means that the furnace was already constructed and likely the fires already lit. This would have been terrorizing. So you have a sea of people already gathered. The embers are rocketing out the top of the searing furnace. Everyone's standing before the giant golden image. The music is about to start. What would you do? Verse 7. Therefore, at that time, again, immediately. Immediate and total response from the masses. When all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Once again, we come to verse 7, and we see all the same phrases repeated ad nauseum, and I read them again instead of skipping over them because we're supposed to feel them. You're supposed to feel the weight of all of those instruments. And this is the statue, yes, that King Nebuchadnezzar set up. And all the peoples and all the nations and all the tongues, they are all worshiping. And they did so immediately. Instant conformity. This is Nebuchadnezzar's attempt at unifying universal expression of worship to generate religious sentiment in order to inspire common interest and total fealty to the empire. He wants loyalty. He wants everybody in, all the provinces. Of course, every ambitious bureaucrat would do this. And every polytheist could do this. If you believed in a pantheon of gods back home, what is it to add one more regional deity from the place you're now living in? It's no big deal. This is the, the remarkable thing about religions that are at one, uh, on one side trying to be universalist, uh, trying to, to get the whole world to be a part of their religion, and at the same time tolerating variations. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as the mother church is your organization. This is a, a remarkably effective tactic 
In order to adhere to the loyalty that's demanded here, you don't have to repent. You don't have to turn away from things. You just have to add a little bit more and and pledge your allegiance here on this day. And again, all that's demanded is external conformity. Listen, Satan is okay with polytheism. You know, Anton LaVey had the Church of Satan, and I'm sure Satan's proud of him, but Satan doesn't really care if you're not a Satanist. He's happy if you're an atheist, if you're a polytheist, if you worship a man or an empire or some made-up deity or a demon. He does not care. It's all the same. But a true worshiper of the one true God could not bow. Why? Because Yahweh is jealous. As the only true God, he knows that uh, adding him to other things is a libel on his infinite character. He also knows it's an infinite detriment to the creature. Why would you set your sights on finite things when the infinite God of the universe offers you himself? To spurn him, to reject him who offers you himself without cost for things you would save up for, work hard for, that are nothings is an infinite insult to who God is. He will have no rivals. He will have no peers. He will share no space in the hearts of his people with other so-called deities, other loves, other priorities. There's some things for us to think about here. We'll just go through some implications quickly. If you're in charge of a government someday, don't do forced conversions. That's just not a good idea. (laughs) Uh, Don't do crusades Don't do inquisitions. Don't convert by the sword or by the fire or by drowning. Don't don't invoke religious mandates, edicts, or pressure. That's just a bad idea. You don't get worshipers from the heart that way. What is the Christian gospel? What is the Christian's message? A proclamation of a savior. Who takes the seed of the gospel and plants it in the heart and brings about new life? Not us, the sower. That grows in secret by supernatural power. We broadcast a message and God causes a growth. We don't do that by the sword. We don't do that by a crusade. Those are terrible ideas. There's a softer side of inquisitions. That that is the conversion by manipulation. I'm not going to take out a sword, but almost the car salesman approach. What do I need to do to get you into the Jesus car today? I'm going to sell you on the amenities. I'm going to tell you how great your life is going to be. I'm going to tell you this is your best life now. If you just add a little Jesus to your life, things are going to go a whole lot better. That is not the message. The adding a little bit of Jesus to your life is no better than external conformity to Nebuchadnezzar's statue while holding on to everything else. The Jesus of the Bible demands all that you are. And he is a holy God, infinitely offended at your sin. And if you do not come to the Lord Jesus Christ on his terms, how does he maintain his holy reputation and I get my sins forgiven so I can be qualified to be in his presence and not be incinerated? We must come to Christ aware of our sinfulness, not manipulated by some ploy to add a little Jesus to my otherwise happy life. Listen, we've seen on the South 202 freeway the billboards that say, hey, come to church and get free tickets to Disney. That's not conversion by the sword. That's conversion by silliness. External conformity is not true worship. Jesus said the Father is seeking true worshipers, and he will get them. He will get them from the heart by a transformation of the heart. So if you're ever in government, just don't go down that road. There's a message that we're creeping into about safety. 
about safety. I have a sign in my garage that says safety third. <laughs> Worship God, have fun, then think safety. I want you to be safe. It's just not the first thing on my list. But if we elevate safety higher than the sign I might have in my garage, we need to think about in terms of asking the question, where is my safety? Is my safety in conformity so that I don't stick out, so I don't get thrown into a fiery furnace when the sound goes? Or is my safety in being thrown into a fiery furnace on right terms with the one true God? That's where our safety is. And we'll dive more into that next time we're in Daniel. I think we need to learn something from Nebuchadnezzar. There are blessings and gifts that come to humanity from God, to believer and unbeliever alike. God's common grace means that rain falls on people who don't deserve it. Sun shines on people who don't deserve it. God is just kind. It shows up in his fatherly care of his universe. And humans can take blessings and gifts from God and turn them into implements of self-exaltation. Nebuchadnezzar had a remarkable privilege an encounter by direct revelation from the God of the universe as a pagan king. And he turned God's direct revelation into something he could tweak into his own self-exaltation. What a tragedy. To take God's gifts and make them about ourselves. There's a lesson here about celebrity conversions. If we can go down this road, remember chapter 2, verse 47. Here is Nebuchadnezzar, the king, answering Daniel, the slave, saying, Daniel, your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords. And, you know, we're ready to come have King Nebuchadnezzar speak at our church. We're ready to have him have a book deal, followed by a movie deal, and then the speaking circuit. Uh, we, we find out really quickly. I mean, in the next verse, Nebuchadnezzar sets up a golden statue as a monument to his own rebellion against the God he just complimented. This leads us to thinking about what was Nebuchadnezzar's encounter with the God of the Bible. We might call this an oblique encounter with truth. You know, when, when you're returning from the moon and you get the trajectory wrong and you skip off the atmosphere and you're just into outer space... You've never done that? Remember when you skipped a rock across a lake and the rock didn't sink because it went... Tree, 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 tree. Nebuchadnezzar has skipped off the atmosphere of God's truth and missed it. He had an encounter with God and, and the theology that he encountered, the, the truth that God could read his mind, tell the future, interpret his dreams, and established by his own sovereignty, this Jewish slave in his presence, to do this very thing, to level him. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't leveled by it. He encountered truth, but he skipped across it like a rock across a pond. We do this with, with really good theology sometimes. The love of God is a doctrine in Scripture that will never be plumbed. We will never get to the bottom of the depths of what it means that holy God would love sinful human beings. And if we're not careful, we'll miss the point. We'll get the wrong takeaway. What do we see in the cross of Christ? Oh, look how lovable I must be if God would go to those lengths to sacrifice his son just so he could have me in heaven with him. I must be that wonderful. <laughs> Missed the point. You're that awful and in such dire straits that the only hope for you was that God himself would come in the flesh in the person of his son and die a horrible death on a cross in order to pay for your sins. We need not get the wrong takeaway. What would you do if you were on the plain of Dura, standing before a golden statue, the furnace blazing stage left, the king on his throne stage right, and a sea of conformity all around? Masses of the most important people face down before an inanimate obelisk. 
Well, there were three young Jewish men with a lot to lose. And we'll find out next time. Uh, Next time for us in Daniel will be October 24th. Uh, Next Sunday night is our quarterly Q&A. So come prepared with your, um, your, your really most difficult theological questions, and we'll make sure John answers them. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your kindness to us in giving us your word. Thank you for recording for us these events with Nebuchadnezzar, that we could read, that we would be humbled, that we would learn. God, give us grace to not come obliquely to your truth, but to allow your word to penetrate to go layers deep, to separate out motives and thoughts, to do with surgical precision what you have designed your word to do in us. God, would you make us pliable and soft, receptive to your truth. God, for any here this evening who do not know you, we pray that this would be a night of confrontation. Who am I really as a sinner before you, O God, and all of your holiness? Would you bring such a one to faith in Jesus Christ? We ask it in his name. Amen.